Is, I don't see Tim. Is Tim around? Yep, Tim's there. And Polly and Joan? Tim is here, but uh, I don't see everybody all the time either. I, I see you, but hey, I, hey, I don't see Marcia. And, uh, so give me a call afterwards. I see you're riding this afternoon. I was. Oh, you have want to ride some more? Give me a call. Okay, we'll do. Sergio, are we live? All right, Mayor Council, we are uh, live on our first um, electronic council meeting. I think this, um, as we've worked through this, been good practice for next Tuesday. Uh, Mayor, do you want to kick us off, and then I'll go from there? Are we getting? So my question is: Do we? Is this an actual meeting? Meaning, do we have to do the pledge and that kind of stuff? No, this is like the work sessions that we did on on uh, Friday. All right, let's go ahead. Yeah. Off, All right, let's, let's just go ahead and do roll call then. Uh, Mayor Bagley, here. Is Don going to call roll call or no? I'll do Actually, it. No, um, just, 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 just go ahead. T Tim, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Marcia, you there? Here I am. Indeed you are. Paul <laughs> Polly, you there? See yes, Polly. I am. Joan, you there? Is yes. Joan here? Okay, yes. cool. All right, Aaron? Present. I see Aaron. I see Aaron. And so Susie, you there? Present, Mayor. All right, cool. Then we got uh, Eugene. Is Eugene on with us? Present, Mayor. Eugene, Mayor. All right, cool. Cool. I see you, Harold. And then we have Karen and we have uh, Kathy Fedler. And who else is with us? Uh, Dan Eman, Jim Golden, uh, Elizabeth Lorena Mills, and Karen uh, Roney. And then we have Longmont, Joni Marsh. And we have, we have Longmont Public Media, and we have um, Susan Wallach, who's streaming to the cities. Um, right, well, well, right we're, we're here for an update. Why don't you do the talking, Harold? We also have Jeff Zayak. He is the um, uh, Boulder County uh, Department of Health Director, and Jeff's going to give an update on the order. Uh, what I wanted to start off with is if everyone can mute. Um, what we found is I've been doing organization. If you don't mute, we start picking up all sorts of feedback into the system. So if everyone can mute, I can control that from here as well. If you have problems doing it, just let me know. Um, what I wanted to start off with a little bit with council today is really um, answering some of the questions that we're hearing from the community uh, and, and providing some information in terms of how we operate and what we do. Um, to give you council a little bit of background on these types of situations, really the key to everything that we do as an organization is really about how we prepare and how we set up the structure for a response for any types of situations. We're really what we consider ourselves to be an all hazard community. And what that means is, is we have any number, we have our emergency management plan and that consists of different annexes. And based on the type of event, we use those to um, basically um, guide our response. Nothing's ever perfect. The best example that I will give to you in terms of preparedness is that some of the work that we've been doing on our infrastructure pieces is coming into this. We actually had 700 VPN licenses and approximately 50 Citrix licenses. And what that means is we were actually able to spin very quickly to allow people to work from home. Um, and so at this point, um, we have exceeded the governor's um, order in terms of the number of people working from home. Um, I have that information back there. I can give you those numbers specifically if you want them, but I can tell you today that we are complying with that order um, and we're moving through it. Um, the one thing I will say is um, we have a lot of experience within the organization in dealing with this. Um, and, you know, using me as an example, whether depending on where you're coming from, whether fortunately or unfortunately, we've all been through a number of issues. Um, and at this point, each and every one of us are really relying on that experience as we move through this event. 
because what I will tell you and the community is um, it is different and it is constantly evolving. The example that I've given to folks is every day seems like the first day of the flood because things are always changing. Um, I want to start off by saying some stuff to the council and the community um, that I think we all need to keep in mind as we're having this conversation and really always keep it at the top of our list. One, um, we know unequivocally that people are um, afraid. They're afraid as to whether or not they will um, get the virus, what that means to their families, um, and, and just the overall impact on friends, family, related to the virus itself. Um, two, um, we're asking via the order that was issued today, people to stay at home. Um, and we know, and I know you all know that this is going to be um, a challenge. We as, in, as humans like to get together. Um, and we know that this is going to create different situations and different responses. And, and we also know that mental health is going to be an important um, ongoing conversation as we move through this. We also know that small, small business owners are having to deal with not only the issue of the stay at home order, but also really sit back and go, what does that mean for me as a small business owner? Am I going to be able to continue? Am I going to have to close? Am I going to have to lay people off? And that's an additional strain. Um, and then finally, or then we also know um, that individuals who work for these companies are having the same conversation. Some people have lost their jobs. Some people are afraid they will lose their jobs. And I want to set that as a framework as we talk about this, because I think it's really important for the community and for the council to understand that we are hearing this. We are also hearing it from the members of our organization. And that is always at the forefront of our mind as we're moving through these situations. There are many different things in play and, and we have many different folks trying to do the best they can. Um, the one thing I will say is this issue continues to change on a daily basis. For example, um, I know we got started a little late, but we found out at 2.30 that we think the governor is going to have a press conference at 4. Um, so uh, I think it's important for all, all of us to be able to watch that. So we'll try to, to move through this as quickly as we can. Um, we have different teams working on different issues. And Dan will go into that as we do a brief um, overview on what we're doing. But there's two teams that I really wanted to highlight based on what we said we're focused on and what we're trying to deal with. Three teams, really. The first team is our partnership with the Boulder County Health Department. As we've said from the beginning of this situation, um, they are Longmont's Health Department, um, and they are the one that the, they started off as the incident command. We're now working as part of a broader command structure integrated within Boulder County, and Dan will talk about that. Jeff's on the phone, um, and Jeff will speak to you about the stay at home order in a little bit, but I want to say that the communication that we've had um, with Jeff and his group has been tremendous. I will tell you that in my conversations with Jeff, um, many of the points that I mentioned previously have been on his mind as he's been making these decisions. Um, Jeff has had a thankless task in many ways as he's been trying to move through this in conjunction with um, the public health directors and other communities. We have a community service team. Kathy's going to provide um, some updates on that. That group is working on issues related to homelessness, um, the needs of our senior community, child care, food generally, um, housing retention. Um, and generally, it's about delivering services to the vulnerable populations of our community. Um, based on the orders, what I will tell you is that we are still trying to understand what that's going to mean because we know because of people filing for unemployment and so on that vulnerable population is growing on us we also have a business group um, and, and they are engaged in conversations related to how we um, approach um, and how we can bring everything together in terms of the business assistance center and provide the information that our local businesses need. Um, and they are churning daily on that. That is a combination of city staff, 
Chamber, LEDP, EDA, Visit Longmont, Latino Chamber. Um, and then we're also incorporating um, Jim in the finance department and Don and Joni in the permitting department to also um, bring all of those, all of the things we do as an organization into play when we're talking about um, the business community. And as I said earlier, we're also integrated into the larger Boulder County um, EOC structure. And I'm gonna ask Dan to come up now uh, to talk about that. I'm gonna share a screen so you're gonna lose us visually. Um, and Dan's got some, a couple of um, charts that he's gonna go over with you all. Dan, which one do you wanna start with? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan Eman, Assistant Public Safety Chief, um, and I also oversee the Emergency Office of Emergency Management. So what you see here is a pretty complicated looking thing with lots of boxes and colors and lines. And I think just as you look at this, it, it really does kind of show you the complexity of this gigantic incident. And there's no way that the city could respond to this thing alone. I mean, as, as you all know, this is a worldwide issue. This is something that's affecting every state in the nation. And what we need to do as a county is respond to it as unified as we possibly can. And we made that decision early on to try to build this structure around public health, who really is the authority in this event. They really are the ones that are issuing orders. Um, Boulder County Public Health is Longmont's public health department too. So this structure is really designed to support public health and all of the other things. So when public health is really just worried about public health sorts of things, epidemiology, all of those kind of things, this broader county structure is designed to support them. So you'll see in things in here like resource management, and that's ordering things like personal protective equipment for all of our first responders. It's trying to support the logistics needs of vulnerable populations. That's a county need. Everybody needs that. So we're trying to coordinate that as a unified group. You see things on here like a planning section. I mean, it's really important for us to try to think through what's happening tomorrow, what's happening next week. Um, like Harold said, this thing is literally changing four or five times a day. We do our best, but who knows what's gonna happen at, at four o'clock today. Sometimes we really don't know. Um, this whole thing is kind of run by a group that's called the agency administrators. That's that box on the top left. Really what that is, is it's made up of all the city managers, the elected officials, um, Jeff Zayak's part of that. And that's where we try to give direction and priorities to the whole structure. And we do that again as a unified group. The thing we're really trying to prevent is one municipality, one county entity from going off and doing something on their own, because that can create a ton of unintended consequences. So this, this really what this visual is without getting too much into every box is really trying to show you guys we're doing this as a county we're doing this as a unified response and you know you'll see this this operations section there i mean one of the things um that's different about the flood in this event so far is this really hasn't been a there hasn't been a big public safety impact so far in fact our, our police and fire calls are down and that's a good thing um we hope it stays that way but the needs have really been on the, you know, the community services side of the world so far, and we'll kind of see how that changes as, as things play out. But that's really the message of this graphic is really just to show you that we're doing all of this as a county and public health is really the lead agency and everything we do is really to try to support them. So Mayor Council, at this point, um, as we move through this, um, I'm gonna stop and I wanna see if there's any questions for, from you all regarding the information that we presented at this point. No questions? I actually have a question. Okay. Um, so one of my, I so because we are under Boulder County Health, 
and we follow their recommendations and their guidelines and their order, what does that do to individuals in Longmont who are on the Weld County side? Um, great question, and I'm, I was going to get to that as part of what Jeff um, is saying, but the, the answer to that question is Eugene right now is actually drafting an order for me to sign that will um, bring many of those same com concepts over onto people who live in Longmont on the Weld County side of the border, or, or on the Weld County side. Um, there are a couple of items that Eugene's working through based on some charter limitations. Um, but in general, what will apply is the, the stay at home component because I can't issue that. Um, and then bringing all of those rules to Sandstone Ranch and Union Reservoir. Most of the businesses that are in Longmont um, on, in the Weld County area actually would meet the definition of essential businesses. So, so generally, we're talking about McLean Western, Smuckers, um, Walmart. Joni's behind me, and she can uh, catch me if I'm wrong. But when you look at the definition within the Boulder County uh, order, those all would be considered essential because McLean Western distributes food, Smuckers is making food, and, and Walmart has the grocery component. Um, if I misstate that, Jeff can correct me. But I will have to issue that piece. I will tell you that I'm also in conversations um, or email conversations, um, but we are trying to touch base with Jeff's counterpart in Weld County. Um, and there's actually two communities in Boulder County that fall into this. Um, Erie's the other community. Uh, and Erie has some different charter components, but they're looking to do the same thing initially. And then hopefully we can um, have the conversation we need to with uh, the director of, of health in Weld County um, to see if they can help us come into alignment. But I will have to issue an order today to do that. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Great. Any other questions from council? So at this point, Jeff, um, if you can unmute yourself, um, we were going to talk about all of the orders. Um, I'm going to ask Jeff to talk about actually the, the Boulder County Health Order um, and what that means to us. And then he will tie the relevant orders from the governor into this uh, because um, they're linked. So Jeff, are you there? Just thanking Harold. He has been an incredible resource for us. He's he's really helped work through some difficult situations, not just here, but um, we've had a great working relationship on many things. So I, I want you to know how much I appreciate Harold and his staff. Uh, they've been they've been incredible partners for us. Uh, the first thing I want to say is, as you already heard, we are living in a unprecedented time right now. This is really a no-win situation uh, in terms of where we're at. We are having to control a virus that we don't know much about. And as you've already heard from both Dan and Harold, that changes every single day. I saw on the national news today that today was the deadliest day of this virus with 185 new deaths in the United States. Um, the virus is definitely acting a bit differently here than it has acted in other places. And just a couple things that has really driven us to get to the point of where we are with this order, I think are important to talk about. Uh, one of those is last week, early CDC released a report that said that 69% of those people that are hospitalized were less than 65 years old. So we were seeing younger um, impacts in our population uh, than we were expecting. And the other thing that was, that was startling to us that, that really had us do some more looks at research were uh, the research from looking at what the disease was doing in the United States and what they found out more about it in China, which is four out of five people that are spreading the disease don't even realize that they have the disease. 
Um, and that's, that's when a virus becomes really difficult to control. And if you think about the difference between China as an example, where there's comprehensive testing, they know where the disease is, they know exactly how to respond to the disease because they've got that kind of testing. We don't have that in the United States. Um, and without that comprehensive testing, we're forced to move to mitigation strategies like we are doing now and like you're seeing other states implement more and more every single day. Um, so, and I also, I also want to make sure I say this, I say this in every presentation because I don't want people to turn to chaos. That is not what we need uh, or panic in this time. The, the virus, again, is going to impact 80% of the people with very mild symptoms. So most people are going to come through this fine, um, and 20% of those people are going to have more serious symptoms, and there's roughly a 1% fatality rate, and that is holding true for the United States. And what we're trying to do is to slow and stop the spread of this disease as much as we can. We know there's going to be significant impacts um, on our hospital systems if we don't do that. Um, and again, it's why we're leading into uh, where we are right now with these, with these public health orders that are in place. We do have to take it seriously. Um, we, if, you, if you've watched the national news, you'll see that New York and Michigan now are, are having serious challenges with their hospital systems, and we don't want that to happen here. We want to take it seriously. We want to do what we can to slow the spread of this virus. And uh, these are some of the best information we have is to take the type of st steps that we're taking now. <clears throat> so let me just tell you a little bit about how we got here, um, because I think it's important for council members to understand this. And, and for sure, uh, Harold just referenced this. Our goal in this process, we've been advising uh, the state health department and the governor's office, there's a, a fairly large group of us that has included people from Larimer County all the way down to El Paso and a core group of public health directors from the metro area. We meet weekly with the, with the state health department. We are looking at models together. We, and those models are changing daily uh, based on what's happening in the United States and what gets plugged into those. But we are looking at the best information to try to make the best decisions at this point. We made a strong recommendation to the governor's office on Sunday night to move forward with a statewide order that would uh, provide consistency across the entire state. And at that point, we had heard that the governor was not ready to move forward with that step. And at the same time, uh, again, as any of you that have been watching national news would know, the virus is continuing to spread fast. Uh, we don't have enough testing. With the, the assumptions uh, at a best case scenario based on what's happened in other states are that for every positive, you have 50 times more people in your community that are actually positive with the disease, which means um, we're only seeing a very small portion of the people who are actually positive in our communities. Um, so it's, it was important for us to take a step forward and uh, try to come together around orders that were consistent. And the consistency that Harold mentioned is a really important point that I want to emphasize. If we have different counties around us doing very different things, then it's going to be harder for us to assure that we're doing the best we can to control the spread of this virus. We worked really hard to get to a point where we were trying to get the entire front range consistent in terms of the orders that would be implemented, um, the timing of those orders, and um, and the approach and how we would move forward with those orders. And we were only able to get the front range counties um, that are surrounding Boulder into that, into that queue. So we have right now um, Jefferson, uh, uh, Boulder, and Tri-County, which is Adams, Arapaho, and Douglas, are all almost identical in terms of our orders. And uh, we modeled our orders after Denver's. Uh, Denver took a step out a little bit in front of us because the mayor wanted to move something more quickly. Um, so we were at that point forced to follow their lead and try to align with their order. So um, that's what we've done. We are very close to Denver's order, although it's not exactly the same. So again, for us, one of the things that felt extremely important was to do the best we could to try to align those measures to make sure that those measures were consistent across our counties so that um, the same controls were happening in Jefferson County as we're happening, as we're happening here. Uh, Broomfield was in alignment with us until the very last minute of those, and they stepped back and went out on their own. Uh, but their order is similar to ours 
it just doesn't have some of the same requirements that ours does. Uh, so that that kind of gives you the landscape. We have worked closely with Mark Wallace, who uh, who Harold mentioned is in Weld County and is the director, and uh, we we put both Harold and Malcolm and Erie in touch with with Mark last night, and we're hoping that uh, Weld County will move forward with something similar as well. Uh, I think you probably heard today that Larimer is also issuing a stay-at-home order, so you're going to see this happen uh, more across the state. Uh, so that people are trying to make sure that we're spreading this, we're not spreading this virus to the maximum extent possible in Colorado. So, uh, so we decided it was ex extremely important for us to move forward in the face of not having something statewide. So, I want to talk a little bit about um, our order. So, our order, um, and in terms of Harold's earlier question about the governor's order, so the way that the orders work is that the the orders that are most restrictive are the orders that are the ones that are upheld. So uh, as an example, the governor's order says 50% of people in the state of Colorado need to be telecommuting. Our order says that no one, unless you're an essential business service, as defined in that, that order that we put out, can actually go to, go to work. So it, ours is more restrictive and would be holding more restrictive in that scenario. If the city of Longmont or the city of Boulder or another city passed a more restrictive uh, prohibition in their local orders, then that would hold as the most restrictive. And obviously, the reason that we have wanted to make sure that we don't have every city doing that is because if you have one city that does one thing and another city that does another, it becomes extremely difficult um, to be able to support those kinds of things if they're not aligned and they're not providing the same levels of protection. So our desire, and, and Longmont has been right there with us, which I appreciate very much, is to support the order that we've put forth um, and to work with us on the language that's in that order. So I, I just want to say again how much I appreciate uh, Longmont's uh, participation and support in this entire process. So uh, let me just stop for a second there and see if there's any questions. And then what I could do is, I don't know how many people have looked closely at Denver's order, but I could highlight the differences between our order and Denver's order to just give you a sense of, of what ours looks like versus what theirs looks like. I've got a couple of questions. Go for it, Mayor Beck. And so, so uh, it's Jeff, right? Yes, Jeff. All right. So here, so there's, a, so I just want to. Uh, there's a first of all, there's a lot of frustration going on in the community. Um, uh, a lot of frustration, concern, and worry on the part of local businesses. Um, and to be clear, as I as I, as I begin these questions, uh, yeah. I am not advocating that money is more important than lives or health. Um, my 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 premise is. The overall question is, are we doing, what will the health impacts of the shutdown be worse than the virus? And the questions are predicated upon things like, things are changing on a daily basis and making, and I, I hear everyone saying, no one really knows what's going on. Um, I'm not a doctor, but Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. So question number one is, we're on lockdown for three and a half weeks, right? Um, we currently do not have any, at least in Longmont, our hospitals do not have anyone in, in intensive care. In the beginning of this, it was all a push to flatten the curve. Right now, there's no one in the hospital. So what's going to happen in three and a half weeks when the virus is still in our community and we're still in our homes? Uh, I do need to, that we just got some information. There are people in the hospital here now. All right. How many? I don't um, three, three in intensive care. All right. Uh, based directly related to coronavirus? That's what we understand. All right. So even that, all right, that. so I'm not sure how many beds we have, but if there are three, um, if they're, I mean, just doing the calculation, if you look at the numbers, I'm not saying this isn't serious. I'm not saying that I'm going to violate or go rogue. I'm just saying, if you look at the numbers, it's 1%. 50 times that amount have not been tested and are unknown, we're now looking at a death rate of 0.05 of 1%. And so my, my, my question is, what's going to happen in three and a half weeks when the disease is still there, people are still going into the hospital, 
whether our hospitals are full or not full, what then? At some point, we will have to go back out into the world. And this has never been about flattening the curve. It's been about, now we're talking about beating the disease, which isn't going to happen. So what's the health department going to do when it's still there in three weeks? Absolutely. So those are those are all, all important points. And we certainly, as I'm sure you can imagine, have been hearing a lot of this as well. And there is no exact answer to this. What I would point you to is to the Colorado Hospital Association met with the state of Washington, and that happened over a week ago. And after their meeting with the state of Washington, the Colorado Hospital Association took this extremely seriously. They distributed a memo that went to every single hospital in the state. They said that we need to take this seriously. The, the hospital surge happened quickly, and they were very unprepared. And it happened again this week with both uh, Michigan, who right now has been very surprised by the hospital surge. You can, there's a lot of information that's out there on this right now, as well as with New York. So just as an example, um, when New York was first talking about this, they thought they were going to have enough, enough ventilators. And now they're, I don't know the exact numbers because I don't want to misquote something, but they're significantly, they have significantly less ventilators than they are going to need. And that means that people are going to die. And that's, that's what exactly the state of New York is saying at this point. And Michigan is repeating the same thing. So this virus is happening fast. If you think about the number of people in the community that are positive, that four out of five people that are spreading this virus, and they don't even know that they have it when they're spreading it, that's exactly why we need to move forward in this in this direction. And we are, I, I'm not going to tell you that we, that we've looked at uh, the, the models are the best information we have. As I said before, this is a no win situation. We are doing the best that we can to make decisions that we believe will have impacts down the road. And the models are telling us that if we don't act now, that we will have hospital surge and we will have difficulty and people will die. And we don't want to get to that point. I, I 100% agree with you about the impacts that we are seeing in the communities and clearly the impacts economically across our and, nation are huge. And I, and I, and I, I hear you. My, my concern is, I, again, it's not a choice between economics and life. What I'm saying is that if we're all holed up in our homes, and the disease is here in three and a half weeks, um, uh, and the small businesses are bankrupt, and we don't have the, the social safety net to help people, the surge is still coming. And so we can't stay in our homes for eight weeks, 12 weeks, six months. And so at some point, bullet holes, uh, starvation, um, obesity from eating Doritos chips, um, heart disease. I mean, the, the numbers, what I'm not hearing anyone say is I am not hearing anyone say what are the health consequences of continuing to do this. Mental illness, I mean, suicide rates, you know, I mean, we're on day two. And I am hearing people, I mean, so just, just for example, right? All right, so I'm getting phone calls. I get the phone call from the CEO of Otterbox, 1,200 employees. Um, I get call, phone calls from our, our, our restaurant vendors. Um, so our restaurants are currently, you know, out of business. Now, you can do takeout, but we got to lay off of all the, all the employees. Now, that's not economics. These are people who can't afford food, who can't afford rent, who can't afford medicine. Um, they are going to have health impacts. Deaths will occur. So, all right, now we come out three and a half weeks later, maybe eight weeks later, I don't know, but vendors are not earning money. They're going to be bankrupt. They're not going to be able, and they're not going to be around in order to support the, the restaurants. You've got dentists, lawyers. I mean, no one's calling. Everyone's at home. No business. We're firing people. We're reducing salaries. We're not paying our mortgages. Again, so the the we are currently i mean so just like so my background screw the fact that i'm mayor screw the fact that i'm on 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 city council my background is economics mba taught at cu uh new york times best selling researcher i mean i'm telling you just like people before were saying that the coronavirus was uh uh was coming and people ignored it i'm telling you we're not going to have a recession we're not going to have a depression we are facing the worst economic disaster in the history of the world and if no one is left after with jobs, we are going to face health consequences much more than a disease that's going to kill 0.05 of 1% of us. And so I, I picture us up on top of Everest and we're stuck on Everest, it's cold and we're scared. And so we're sitting in our tent 
sucking our oxygen. We still have to get down the mountain. We're still going to freeze. So coronavirus is going to be there in three and a half weeks, um, except that I'm going to be out of business. My employees won't have money to pay their rent, and neither will 80% of the small businesses and other in industry in our, in, our, in our state. And so what then when there's no safety net? And so I, I think that the, I think the, do, the health administrators, the hospital workers, the doctors, they're all getting paid. And I think the tunnel vision here on this disease, um, is, it's worrisome. Um, and flattening the curve, fill up the ICU, lighten it up. Um, because we got to start, I want someone to come over and spit in my mouth so I can go get in the hospital now because I'm not going to die because we're not full. But in the meantime, we're all bunkered down in our homes and we're, stop, we're not going to stop this disease. We're just killing all the resources we have to save us when the disease comes. And I've listened in on these phone calls with Mayor Hancock and the Metro mayors. I've talked to the epidemiologists who are advising the governor. And the one thing I hear from everybody is no one knows what to do. And so what we're doing is just doing this out of panic and we're strangling ourselves. Then you throw into the fact that it's, a, oops, sorry, I'm in the dark here in the mayor's office. Then you throw in the fact that, um, that it's campaign season and you got Democrats and Republicans going at it. This is just freaking stupid. And I'm not panicking. I'm just saying it's only a matter of time before people who think like me start doing things that are going to be quite concerning. Cincinnati, they're not even responding to assaults. They're not even responding to uh, misdemeanor crimes. Here in Longmont, that's gonna happen. So then what? We're letting people out of our jails. We don't have our courts open. We've basically suspended the, the, the freedom of assembly. I mean, this is insane. And I just think somebody needs to say it. It is insane. So the rest of you guys can do what you want. I'm gonna follow the current orders, but this is only going to get worse and it's not gonna be the virus that's, that's gonna cause it. That's all I have to say. Well, and I, and I can respond to a couple of those things, and I appreciate hearing you say that you're going to follow it. Um, one of the things that we saw in China that is absolutely part of this, and I know that um, Harold has the reference to this, some of these studies and the research, is that there, this has to happen. You can't just shut things down and not do anything. You're exactly right, because what happens when you do that is you get a spike you shut the spike down, and then as soon as you open things back up, the spike comes back up. So I was misunderstanding what you were asking me at the front end. Clearly, there is there is options for us to take that we are taking. What we talked about the governor's, what we talked to the governor's office and CDPAT about, is the latest research that talks about ramping up testing. So we know that if we can shut this down, and we can slow the spread of the virus. And we can ramp up testing at the same time, which there is, there is an opportunity to ramp up testing. The Colorado Hospital Association has reached out to hospitals. There's a new FDA test that was released today. Um, they have some testing components that are coming forth. And at the same time, we ramp up our ability to really be able to make sure we're doing all the contact investigations, we're isolating people and making sure that we're quarantining people who we think have the virus, but we don't have the test back yet. Those things together, along with the shutdown, is what was successful in China. And there's guesses about how close we are to being able to be effective at that based on where we are in the United States. But that is the approach that's being taken. That's what's being talked about right now. That's, you probably have heard that again if you've been listening to the national news. Those components are absolutely included in a shutdown, is trying to make sure that those pieces are in place. So we when, can't when, guarantee. When will we have, so I mean, exactly, we, unless we have testing or a vaccine, what we're doing is useless. And so, right, when, when will we have a near instantaneous test for this virus? Is it coming in a week, two weeks, three weeks, eight weeks? I mean, when? Because if it's not coming soon, um, it's not going to matter. That's right. It's expected to be within two weeks is the best information that we're hearing. I'm happy to send that to you as a follow-up after this um, um, so that you can see at least the information that I know. And there's, and there, as you know, there's no guarantees in this. There's no guarantees. Well, there's no guarantees, but the one guarantee I can tell you is that uh, you cannot, I mean, for, for example, right? Um, my law firm, 24 employees, right? We always keep on hand six months of cash reserves. That's going to be gone in less than a month because everything stopped. You cannot continue to pay people 
when there's not money coming in. Because contrary to belief, whether you're Republican, Democrat, money means nothing. It's paper. It's the production. It's the resources. It's the effort you get and, and produce to make things happen. Nothing's happening right now. And so the, I, I, I know that. So I don't know what's going to happen with the virus, but I do know that. If this isn't done quick, um, it's not going to be good. And it has nothing to do with the virus. So um, uh, uh, I, I guess what I, I don't know what else to say about it other than I, I just hope that I don't even hope I insist that uh, the Boulder County Health Administrators, the state administrators, the governor and all the people who are elected and serving patients who get salaries and we're focusing on this one cause of death. Um, why don't we just go home and just ban tobacco? We will save infinitely more lives. But we're all worried because, I mean, if 100 people die in a car accident, um, we're all going to, you know, we're, we're not going to care. But if 30 people die on a plane, we're going to put it on national news and we're all going to look at it. We're scared to death that grandma and grandma, one of them will die because we have to choose who to save. But right now, I'm, uh, we are going to see so much more death, illness, etc., unless people start, stop looking at the virus models, which nobody can tell me that they're accurate, and start looking at the economic models and start guessing what in the hell is going to happen because it's not a guess. It's coming. And you've got less than three, three and a half weeks to figure it out. So that vaccine isn't here. Like, stat, um, you're going to have, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll abide for a time, but um, not, not long, not till the 17th. Are there any other questions from council? Yes, I would like to say something. Harold. Yep. Harold. We can hear you calling. Okay. Okay. I would like to let, uh, um, Jay speak some more because we're here to listen to Jay and to hear Boulder County's strategy. I would also like to say, uh, and I particularly would like to hear an update on how we are doing with, uh, in the county and locally with masks and other protective equipment for the hospitals. Um, I'd also like to know whether we have any capacity for more testing. To me, if we are gonna learn the tests, the lessons from China, from Korea, they have done universal testing so that they can sort people out so that we can get the people who are most who are most severely effective out of uh, put them in quarantine and the rest of the um, businesses can go on. Um, Denmark is also doing something which is much more sensible than what we're proposing to do, which is that they are going to pay 75 to 90 percent of every person's wages to the business so they can keep them going. That will keep them going for a while instead of handing somebody $1,200, which will not last very long when our rents are now going past that. So um, I also would like to reassure people that if you look at the order, the Denver order, it's really very comprehensive. I looked at it yesterday. I read it because a friend of mine who runs a business um, mailing, uh, shipping out um, online learning um, wanted to see if there was an exception for him, and there actually is. The order is very, very well thought out. It lists number of, of uh, exceptions for basic infrastructure, basic businesses. This is what we need to keep going with our basic businesses, our basic infrastructure, all those things, and there are numerous it's a very, very well thought out plan for offering uh, exceptions to certain businesses that are really essential and um, and essential infrastructure. And so I would urge everybody to read the order. I hope that our order from Boulder County Public Health, which you, which Jay said was based upon the Denver order, I hope it is that comprehensive and offers exceptions for basic essential infrastructure, basic essential businesses, 
And um, anyway, I just uh, I would like to go back to listening to Jay uh, speak so that we can actually move on with this um, uh, meeting. Thank you. I'm done. Harold, this is Tim. Yep. Uh, is it Jay or Jeff? It's Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, two two questions. Uh, on, I, it, I've looked at the order. Um, I, I'm, I am puzzling over number nine under essential businesses. Um, a licensed a gun and ammunition retailer. So you could maybe share why that's viewed as an essential business. Number one. Number two. Uh, under the activities, I'm going to interpret what I've read to mean that uh, uh, walking, biking, the kinds of things that people do to maintain both health, and health, uh, both emotional and physical health, so long as we're practicing social distancing, are, those things are allowed. Because that's one of the questions that we're all getting. You know, can we still ride our bike? Can we still, I understand you can't congregate in parks and have play dates and those kinds of things. But the, but the kinds of outdoor activities that at least would allow families um, to take a walk along the greenway or in their neighborhoods would be acceptable. Anyway, I'll, I'll mute myself and listen to the answers. Thank you for those questions. And I'll, I can touch on the PPE question that was asked earlier as well. So we have uh, under our emergency operations center that Dan was referencing, we have a distribution uh, of PPE that goes out to priority listed people that include healthcare, um, our long-term care facilities, some of the uh, ones that are um, of more risk. And at this point, we have enough for a couple weeks. We are expecting some more PPE to come. I know that the governor's office, because uh, there has been a challenge with the national level PPE getting to us in a way that f feels like it's gonna be sustainable for the long-term. I know the governor's office has put together an innovation task force that is looking at how can we generate PPE within our own state. Um, so we are looking and hoping to that. Um, I think Boulder County, we're actually better situated. We've had a lot of donations, including the St. Brain Valley School District, which donated over 8,000 masks. Um, we also just received our strategic national stockpile um, distribution. So in terms of masks for us, um, depend, and with the predictions that we're seeing coming forward, uh, we think we have enough for two weeks or more at this point, and that, that's obviously going to depend on what happens in our community. Uh, the second, the other questions that I heard you ask about, uh, one was, if I heard it, was our, why is ammunition and, um, and I think it's ammunition, I don't remember exactly how it's phrased in the, in the order, but um, why are guns and ammunition considered an essential service? We talked with our sheriffs across the state and it was very clear um, and from two perspectives, um, from a constitutional right as well as from the ability to have and get ammunition as well as guns, not just for uh, police and sheriff, but also for other um, uh, like security guards, those kinds of things that need to be armed, that that needed to be included. <clears throat> and then I think you had, the other question you had was about why is it that it's okay for people to be out walking around um, in parks and places like that? And we we really had to balance this closely. It's important uh, for some of the reasons that have already been mentioned about maintaining our ability to, to keep a positive mental health. Um, so we've stressed in the order and we are doing targeted um, uh, education and outreach around the order to make sure that people of groups of four or less are able to go out together um, as long as they are maintaining uh, the, the separation of six feet. And that's really critical in all of this. We want people to be able to, to go out and they, we don't want them to be, it doesn't help and it doesn't make sense for people to crowd on trails that are narrow. So we are doing some uh, direct education outreach. We put up some signs on our trailheads that we know we've had um, challenges with even when we weren't in this situation. Um, but we want people to be able to get out and to be able to walk and exercise. And we just want them to do it in an area where they have the ability to have the isolate or the uh, separation of at least six feet from each other. So that is, that is what others have landed on across the nation. And we felt like that was important to keep in our order as well. Jeff, this is Tim Waters and I'm the one who asked that question. I wasn't asking why, I was confirming that that was, that was the case. I think that's a good decision, and I wanted to make certain that I was interpreting it properly. 
uh, oh, both okay. for my family and for the people who continue to ask me, is what we're doing okay? And, I, and I've said yes. Not only is it okay, it's important that you that you get out and that you uh, that you, rec you practice good social distancing, but you also take advantage of our environment and and uh, stay emotionally balanced and and get enough vitamin D in your system and those kinds of things. So, Polly, I just wanted to follow up also on the PPE question locally. Um, we talk to our hospitals every day, multiple times a day, and our local clinics too, like Salud and Hope Life. Uh, for public safety, on the police side, we're, we're pretty good. Um, they typically don't need PPE as often as the, the fire department and the EMS. On the fire side, they're, um, we're, we're getting pretty close. We're probably in that week to two weeks where we're going to start running out. Uh, they're starting to conserve what they what they use. It's certainly gonna. It's certainly our biggest need right now is PPE on the fire side. Um, there's a certain type of mask that well, the whole country is looking for right now. That is kind of the shortage. We're we're scouring the the country for those things. Um, we're like Jeff mentioned. We're kind of in the same big system that all the county entities are. Um, he mentioned the strategic national stockpile that. We did get a small chunk of that. There isn't nearly as much as we asked for, but I think you can imagine everybody in the country is looking for that sort of thing. But that certainly is our biggest need. Um, you know, I'd say on the fire side, we're you know in that eight to ten days, and we're going to try to stretch it as far as we can. But we have been shopping like crazy everywhere we can look for it. Are there any other questions from council? Yeah, I have a question, um, and this is in regard to the grocery stores. Uh, how are we yes. able to mitigate the number of people in the stores when they get crowded? How are we able to ensure social distancing um, in those spaces? Thank Jeff, you for that question. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the first thing we'd like you to do is if you if you are seeing crowded grocery stores, and I can give you this number in, uh, when you're ready, uh, but we do have a, call, a central call line. Um, we want to know about those situations. Our approach with the grocery stores has been to have, and I know many of them have moved to this, is to move to high risk uh, populations going to the grocery store at a certain time, but then requesting that people are following social distancing. We know for sure that we're going to have to spend time educating people. We want you to let us know if you're not seeing that happen. We are spending a fair amount of time looking at how we get the message out, visiting grocery stores specifically to help reduce um, the or make sure that there is social distancing in place because that is what is going to, to allow us to be successful at reducing the spread of this virus. Um, with again, that many people spreading the virus and not knowing it, uh, that social distancing aspect is really important. And obviously groceries uh, at the store are also very important. Uh, and I'd heard a lot of feedback from folks to not try to, to limit the grocery store specifically to certain numbers of people and things like that because it was going to be so difficult to, to, uh, to institute. So we are going to focus on the education approach, make sure that people are following the, the social distancing to the maximum extent possible. Um, Harold? Oh, sorry. Um, this is my hand's been up for a real long time. Are we not doing that? What? I can't see hands, so we're going to need uh, people jumping in. So, all right, after Polly, you can, please. You can text if you can text me that you want to come in. That would um, or you send me a message. There's a message function. Uh, I just saw yours, so I just saw yours come up. So, what you did, Marcia, would help. So, Polly, go ahead, and then if we can have Marcia come in, that'd be great. I'm sorry, I. Marcia's free to do with this. I, I just wanted to get some update on the testing because to me, this is really where we're falling down is not testing. It's nearly impossible to get a test. I've tried and it's nearly impossible. And to me, this is a real flaw in what we're doing. If New York City can have 20,000 people tested a day, we should be able to do a better job in Colorado. Thank you. Thanks for that question. And testing is on all of our minds. Obviously, uh, there's been uh, there's been a ton of feedback that's pro been provided to the governor. I know the governor's told us that he's met with the vice president 
multiple times uh, to stress this as well. We do, uh, ha we do see that there's opportunities to increase testing in our own state. Denver has been successful at doing that, um, as I mentioned before. I don't know the technicalities of all the tests, but what I can commit to do after the meeting is to make sure that I send that to Harold and he can distribute it to all of you so that you can see how we've reached out to hospitals to ramp up testing. Most of the hospitals that we've heard back from at this point said that they can do that. It's probably gonna take a couple of weeks for us to get there. Um, but we, we are already seeing an increased ability to do testing and especially in the Metro Denver area specifically. Um, Council Member Christian, so we're also starting to see um, information coming to us indicating that we may see some of that closer to us. And, and so we know that's happening. The, the point that I wanted to make to Jeff's point is when you look at these two things, and Jeff, if I misstate this, tell me, just jump in. But the conversation I had is the, the, the order that he's talking about really is dependent on the testing piece because I think what the end goal in this is to then shift from isolating the well people to really identifying and isolating those that have the virus. Is that correct, Jeff? Yeah, that is exactly correct. Um, and I'm I'm happy to make sure, uh, Harold, if, if you don't have the link to that uh, research that I can send that and you can share that with council as well. And it's, again, it's the same thing that you've heard, uh, Tom Friedman, if you've watched uh, the national press talk about uh, in this last couple of days, and it's being repeated a lot by the governor of New York and others. Okay. Uh, council member Martin and then council member Peck. Uh, thank you, Harold. I think that, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that we uh, need to reckon with the number of people who during the last two weeks of being of staying at home by following recommendations have had this virus and recovered. Um, I'm one of those, at least to a you know, 95% certainty, according to my personal physician. And um, I was never sick enough that I would have stopped my normal activity if I hadn't known what was going on and if it hadn't been a, 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 an advisory from the governor to do so. Um, so I would have infected several hundred people or, or at least exposed several hundred people. And I think we are forgetting that that's the um, primary reason for these stay-at-home orders. Um, I have questions that uh, I promised constituents that I would ask, and um, they have to do with the people who are experiencing homelessness right now. Um, the first thing is um, we, have, we have some no eviction orders in place, but that is apparently, um, uh, there's an exemption for or low cost by the week um, motels. And we have a couple of those our home day laborers tend to stay in when they can. Um, I am concerned that the way things look, people can be turned out of those places and, um, and uh, uh, at least one of those hotels, I'm not naming names, but at least one of them has distributed flyers that say pay or you'll be kicked out. Um, so what's the story with those? Because it clearly is a public health problem for the more people who are unhoused and exempt from the stay at home order on the account, um, the greater a public health concern those people become. Yeah, absolutely. So have, uh, and... Go ahead, Jeff. No, I was gonna. I was gonna say absolutely. We've done a lot of work on that, and I was gonna defer to see if you wanted to answer, or you wanted me to answer. So uh, I'll start answering it. Um, uh, I have Elizabeth and Eugene on here if uh, we start moving. Uh, but the uh, executive order um, twenty twenty twelve. Uh, uh, direct the governor directed Dola, CPLE, and Dora. Um, to identify lawful measures to avoid removing or executing eviction procedures, proceeding procedures against tenants or, or mobile homeowners without cause 
or, or as a result of late payment or rent or minor tenancy violations. Um, then they have the, the DPS and the sheriffs and others working in terms of the enforcement mechanism. In, in Boulder County, the sheriff actually does the enforcement for evictions and they're not um, enforcing that. I don't think the courts are taking those either. Um, so those are two pieces that come into that conversation. Um, the only thing that, that I was briefed on that I think still is, is hanging out there, but it really more is to a, uh, I need to speak louder. So the only thing that um, is not, um, uh, that, that still has some capability is evictions related to health issues. And specifically the example that I received is that if you had something, uh, a house with meth or something like that, that is a different conversation. I know there's, um, I've heard there's a couple, there's a few evictions that were actually done before this occurred. Um, and that's a slightly different conversation that folks are trying to work on. But um, what we're briefed on, those measures are in place. Is that correct, Dan? Jeff, did I miss anything? Liz, did I miss anything? No, I think you covered most of what I was gonna talk about um, with exception of just making sure that people are aware that if we do have people who have tested positive, we do have a place for homeless folks to go uh, to assure that they're not mixing uh, with the general population. Uh, and But all those things are true and we are working, we have already worked really closely with our housing and human services folks on not evicting somebody or making sure that they have a place to go if they are in a meth uh, impacted house. Okay, thank you very much. That that's reassuring because there are, as I said, some uh, landlords who are saying or are telling their residents otherwise, and I want to be able to reassure them. Um, and I think I think the key piece on that, Councilmember Martin, and this is what we're also thinking about, is if you can forward those communications to us so we can um, send them to the appropriate location, and so we can get accurate information out. That would help us a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, it's discussed on Facebook, which makes it harder. Um, but I, if you'll tell me where who to contact, then I can tell them who to contact. We will get that out to council in terms of we'll figure out who the best person is for each issue. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the other question that I have is uh, about the uh, the people experiencing homelessness who are in fact using our shelters now um, at night. They uh, don't have any place to go during the day because every place that they used to go and sit um, is closed. Um, are we considering putting up uh, uh, some kind of a home base for the people in coordinated entry where, you know, I'm thinking tents, I'm thinking a gazebo, someplace where they can get something to drink and, and that it would be uh, reasonable to, to stay there rather than going wandering around um, uh, causing public health problems, potentially. Um, I am especially concerned with the idea that, that um, they are, um, uh, asymptomatic, but infected, because we have screening to get into the nightly shelters, but there are a, a lot of people that would not respond to the kind of screens that that we're able to use. That's it. Jeff, you want to take this one? Or I can jump in uh, too. I, I, would, uh, I would defer to Karen maybe first, but I can answer, take my shot at answering it if, if because Karen's pretty, involved in this process so so what i can tell council is um so we do um, we're working with hope and our partners in terms of um, that sheltering component and there are screening uh, components associated going in i think we all do understand that it may not catch everything but they're they're doing the best they can to screen folks um, that, that's also occurring at the shower location as well correct so we're doing the same thing there 
the, the challenge that um, I, we actually had this conversation to on our administrators call is is also what does that mean in terms of the distancing and, and that type of issue? Um, and, and there's a, I know there's a conversation starting um, in that group and it'll probably make its way into Karen's group. It's a challenge, to be honest with you, just because of um, proximity and those types of issues and potentially actually creating a situation for more spread. And, and so that's, that's sort of what we're talking about. Um, it's also, to give you a sense, it's, um, so we're partnering with uh, Boulder County, the city of Boulder and, and others in terms of the CRC location. Boulder, um, they, are, they are receiving individuals. Um, the, the cost of that is about $25,000 a month. And that'll tie into some other conversations that Jim's gonna be bringing forward. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, uh, Harold. So uh, Jeff, hi, uh, can you tell me what the percentage increase in affected people in Boulder County has been? Uh, I can give you, let me just pull up the numbers. I don't know that I have totals um, okay. from the very start, but I can tell you what our current uh, situation is, if that would help. Yes, it would. Okay, bear with me for just one second. Okay. So, um, and this is as of this is as of today. And I can also uh, maybe what I'll do is just let you know from a statewide basis. Just in general, we're holding right. pretty closely to what the rest of the nation is seeing. About 11% of the individuals um, that are tested are showing up positive. 9% uh, of those individuals uh, that are positive are hospitalized, and that's pretty close to the 10% rate that we're seeing at the national level. And we're still seeing a 1% fatality rate and in Boulder County specifically, um, and I, I'm sorry, I do not have uh, any numbers for Longmont at this point, but in Boulder County as of today, we have a total of 55 cases um, and 31% of those are in the 19 to 29 year old range, 38% of those are in the 30 to 59 year old range and 31% are 60 years of age and older and that uh, tracks back a bit to those numbers that I had reported earlier when I was presenting that CDC was reporting that it's impacting a younger age group than than was first thought to be the case. Okay, um, the other thing, actually what I really wanted to know was on a daily, weekly basis, what, what has been the percent of increase in new, uh, how fast is it growing in Boulder County? And um, I think this actually, my question actually relates to some of the issues that Mayor Bagley brought up. Um, how fast is it growing in the, and making a case for why we are doing this? So I can, get those number, I can get those numbers for you, but I don't have them right here. We, ha we can calculate that and send it to Harold to distribute to council, but I don't have that offhand right here. Okay, great, I would appreciate that. And um, I just want to address some of the things that Mayor Bagley mentioned and uh, reassure him and the public that I think I myself am also very concerned about the economic uh, research, the economic impact that this is going to have. But none of us, none of us here are doctors and this is not something that Longmont has drummed up. But I actually asked for this uh, work session to address some of the issues, the evictions that Councilwoman Martin brought up, the uh, hopefully being able to extend leases when a lease is up without raising the rent, um, possibly helping people meet their rent by using some funds that we have in the city. Uh, for example, the affordable housing fund and Harold, you did uh, uh, address that with me. So if you could, because I was thinking that perhaps we could use the affordable housing fund for um, no interest or low interest loans to people who are at home, but need are losing uh, paychecks. So could you address that with the larger group, Harold, as to why that affordable housing fund may or may not be a source of us to help our residents um so I, we had a section where i was going to ask kathy to give an update and it 
Okay, I can wait. Yeah, yeah, I can wait. Help because you context to everything. Right, and okay. the other question, the other question, Harold, that uh, I would like you to address, and one of the reasons that I wanted to have this study uh, work session is that um, I feel that council has to speak with one voice. It seems like I understand the the, the bit of panic, the anxiety on, on the mayor's part and on other parts, but it, it is worrisome to me that we give that message out to the larger residents, to the larger population. So we had spoken when we had our one-off, Susie Hidalgo Fearing and I were with you about what can we do as council to bring this message to the residents and how do we do that? Uh, you had mentioned that perhaps we could have um, either channel eight or channel, channel three, however you wanna do that. Explanations where we are actually talking and giving an update, we're all doing giving the same message out so that we know where the city is, what it is we plan to do, where the hospitals are, uh, et cetera. Everything that you're telling us but not everybody has access to doing this. So I still want to address that, if not at the end of this session, at another one. I think that message needs to come, come faster than, than we're giving it. So thank you, that's it. So I definitely have some things that I, 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 need, to, I need counsel to, to, to think about how you're part of that. Again, I have those at the end of this to say. Okay, great. And what All right. Like. I think part of when we talk about it, I talked about this with all the council members just early on. When we uh -huh. said, how, how do we message certain things and how do we move through this? Um, honestly, I think the challenge is, and I'm, I'm also watching other work occur right now. Right. Um, right about the time we think we have everything, we know what we need to message, it flips on us. And so that's been the challenge on this is just the pace of change. Okay. Um, and so we're still working on that, but I'll talk about that as we get that's great thanks hey, Harold I just want to chime in real quick I'm not panicking I'm not panicking I did the question I'm going to have forget all the other possible causes of death and illness when we talk again with the county after two weeks so we've got 55 cases which means we're going to have 0.5 or maybe one death uh, we're going to have uh uh five people hospitalized i'm going to want to know how many mental illness breakdowns have we had how many they how, how many people have been hospitalized for mental illness and how many suicides have we had because i mean not to mention all the other things that are kind of going to come as a result of the economy i'm just saying i want to know what this is causing in our community you're not hearing panic you're hearing frustration and i can't speak with one voice when i'm in district i don't know what our voice is but I'm, what I'm stating is not panic. What I'm stating is this is just brutal facts. This is, this is what's ongoing currently. And so I'm going to want to know what are the health impacts of doing what we're doing? That, those are my questions in the future. So in council knows uh, in our meeting today with public safety, we're going to be keeping track of all of that data and try to see see movement and see what we're seeing. Dan, in addition to doing this, works with the lead and core groups. So we're getting, we're gonna hope to get real-time information because in Jeff, I was gonna talk to you about this afterwards, but I think as we're getting that, I also wanna share that with you so you can see what we're seeing in real time in terms of churn within the community. Absolutely. All right. Um, any more questions? On this, Jeff, do you have anything else we need to finish? Sorry, I had it muted. No, I'm. Uh, that's all I, I wanted to cover. I do want to share, um, if people are interested, the call number is for their call center is 720-276-0822. And I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It's 720-776-0822. Uh, Mayor, Council, are there any more questions for Jeff? He's probably got to jump on a hundred other meetings. Uh, I just want to make sure that we you've asked everything of Jeff you need to. Um, Harold, this is Pauline. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? I can't get you on the chat. Uh, I, I can hear you, Polly. Oh, okay. I just had one more question. Um, when you uh, look at, uh, I'm wondering why, um, oh Lord, I'm sorry. Um, I'm wondering why it is not recommended that we wear masks. Because when you um, look at Asia, one thing that they do is they have absolute uh, universal masking. That's one of their strategies. And I'm wondering why we are not doing that. I realize there's a problem with supply, but if nothing else, we could, um, we can make our own masks or we can use scarves or something is better than nothing to me. Um, that is not so much to prevent us getting it, but to prevent us spreading anything we might have. I'm just wondering why, um, is this just a matter of supply from Jeff? Uh, I'm, this is a question for Jeff. Is it just a matter of supply? Because there are a lot of, a lot of women out there sewing up a storm of masks to give to hospitals. So uh, that's my question is for Jeff. Why no masking? Uh, and it, the the answer to that is what you already talked about. And what we do is we look at the World Health Organization and the uh, Centers for Disease Control in terms of the recommendations that they make. And when we get down to, um, so I, I don't discourage person, people making personal masks for themselves or taking those kinds of um, those kinds of things uh, into their own hands. When we're talking about healthcare workers and um, having them masked up, there are certain standards to make a mask that are required in order to be in those environments. Um, but simply cutting down on the, the ability for somebody who coughs to spread the disease. Uh, can can happen with some of the things that you've talked about, but there is specific requirements and recommendations when we distribute to healthcare or um, fire or anybody like that that is responding um, to one of these to one of these situations. Hey Jeff, or just a council, Jeff. I don't know if you know this. The the mayor just a, uh, issued a, a statewide stay at home order, um, and council will obviously looking at this and, and bringing it together and, and Jeff I'm sure we need to talk about it's the same and what does that look like and those types of issues yeah no I did not know that was going to happen today and I, I think you said the mayor but I, you meant the governor right oh yeah the governor the governor just issued a stay, stay at home order okay thank you any more questions for Jeff Thanks, Jeff. I think yeah, I'm not seeing any questions. Question. Sorry. Jeff, can you repeat that number again? Yes, it's seven. I'm going to look at my document to make sure I didn't write this down wrong. So bear with me just one second. It won't take long at all. Thank you. Yep. It is 720 <laughs> And if there's nothing else, I want to thank you all for inviting me to the meeting. I really appreciate the opportunity to to answer questions like this with you. So thank you, Jeff. You're doing a good job. I mean, as much as I'm a, I'm frustrated, you're doing good work. Thank you for for everything you're doing. Thank you. Um, so the next person I want to bring up is uh, Joni Marsh. She's going to talk about where we are on the business side. I will preface this Jeff by saying. Zayak. Has left the meeting. Um, on the business side is changing just as fast. Um, I know that they reached agreement on major points within the legislation. Um, CML is involved in that. We have folks looking at it. Um, so we're still trying to understand what's out there. But Joni, can you come up and talk about where we are and what we're doing? Good afternoon, Mayor Bagley, members of council, Joni Marsh, city manager. So the Longmont Economic Development uh, Partnership, along with our advanced Longmont partners in coordination with our OEM staff, have put together a coordinated response team. We have been meeting daily and coordinating efforts around what's going on with our local business community. Um, the team is really looking at all facets that 
includes small business, large business, and how we're communicating all the updates to legislation, policy, funding resources that are ever changing. We've created a community hub, which resides on the LEDP website. And that hub is updated every day. It was last updated this afternoon. And all everyone's website points to that. So we're able to get people not only to um, Department of Labor, but also to how uh, to apply for small business loans. So we're really making an effort to coordinate that. And we've done two surveys have gone out from the chamber in that group to gauge where businesses are at. We did one last week, and then we sent one out again yesterday with some updated questions, really looking at what is happening to the small business community um, from a um, employment perspective, laying off staff, what are their needs, and we're going to continue to meet daily, looking at ways that we can help to put dollars towards that. I've had a lot of questions about what the city may be doing in regard to dollars towards that. And we're looking at some of the contract dollars in our 2020 economic development uh, contracts specifically that we may be able to repurpose for loans um, to businesses. You've seen some of that come out of the city of Denver and the city of Inglewood. Others are looking at that as well. So as I said, we're meeting daily um, and really trying to reach out to the business community and keep on top of things. And in conjunction with the public health order, I imagine we'll also be getting a significant number of calls about people's businesses, if they can continue to operate, who's an essential business. And we'll continue to work with the call center that Jeff mentioned um, and what's going on. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Any questions from council? <clears throat> all right. Did you all hear Joni? Are there any questions? Harold? So just so council knows, um, I yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to thank Joni for um giving that report, I think it's, I mean, we're really, it is really important that our small businesses and all the businesses be able to survive this. It's gonna be hard for every one of us, every one of us, you know, everybody's, our pensions are down, every, you know, whatever. It's all gonna be difficult, but we really, as a city, are committed to trying to keep our small businesses and other businesses healthy and happy and trying to support everybody so we can keep going after this ends and it will end. Right, and so part of what Joni was talking about too that we're also doing, what, our, what a lot of folks may not know is that within our organization, and this is really something um, where we had a couple of people join our organization that are really talented when it comes to issues related to how we work with FEMA, how we work, and we have Kathy Fedler behind us, who you know has been instrumental in leading the um, the Boulder County group in terms in terms of the DR funding via HUD. But we also have, um, and I just dropped uh, Peter, Peter and Charlie. I just dropped their last names. Um, you know, we're lucky to have those two individuals. Charlie used to work for FEMA. Uh, Peter. Um, really cut his teeth on our flood recovery and they're working with Dan. And it's really also about this larger perspective of taking what's happening within the Small Business Administration, how does that link into what's happening and what we're hearing from FEMA and how does that tie into the HUD piece? And that's really the work that we have to now move very quickly. So, so the council and the community knows, we're not only really trying to manage what we're dealing with today in terms of the churn, but we're also shifting to say, how do we bring these component, components together? I know some cities have already run some programs out, but we also want to understand is what's the volume and, and, and take a little bit of time to understand how we can put together the best package we can so we don't get up to a point in time where we realize we probably didn't do it right. Now we don't have money to do it correctly. Um, I've asked Joni and Peter and Dan, that's going to be on our list tomorrow with also the, the um, 
partners that I mentioned earlier is really trying to get something solidified tomorrow. So I'm sort of, I'm amping the pace up on that as well. Um, because to many points, and, and something I want counsel to know, and Jim's going to talk about this, we're also fundamentally dependent on the success of the businesses in our community and the small businesses because that's also what drives our revenue stream. And, and we're having to, to look at some of those issues. And Jeff and Jim will come on shortly and, and talk to you about what we're looking at and how we're preparing for it because in many ways that also impacts what are we going to be able to do when we're looking at some of these issues. Um, but Jim will come on shortly. Um, Kathy, do you want to, uh, are there any more questions from council? I'm trying to look at the, the list. Harold, I have, I have seen any. I have one. Yes, um, yes, it seems like this is the right time to ask. This is about people in the gig economy uh, who are not eligible for unemployment. And um, I'm wondering which of them are uh, essential, uh, permitted, non-essential, et cetera. I'm thinking specifically of people who are doing uh, domestic lawn services and house cleaning services. Uh, to me, that it seems like there's a difference between these two because uh, the lawn services kind of people can practice social distancing while they work. Um, I'm not so sure about personal cleaning services, but uh, I know some kinds of in-home care are prohibited and some are allowed. Can can you go over uh, what the order means with respect to those people? Because they're very vulnerable. Um. Um, I'm going to look to Dan. I, I know we've got folks looking at this. So when you talk about the gig economy in general, I think there was an exemption for that broader transportation in terms of taxi and Uber and those issues. That's what Liz are using. Um, Liz, are you on? Yes, I am. So with the caveat that we don't have the order yet from the governor that's going to govern, just looking at Boulder counties, I don't see how lawn service would fit into um, the essential businesses. So I think part of that gets into, so here's where the question comes in. So maintenance, so my specific question to Boulder County in terms of maintenance, and as we look at what we need to do um, in terms of maintaining our parks and our, and our golf courses, and when I described that, they said that maintenance component of not keeping your yard and your home actually would qualify. Um, and so that's that's a conversation I have with the county. Um, that's why uh, Council Member Martin, when we talk about call this number and really push people into the county is because they're going through that right now and answering those questions. So what I can say is when I asked about maintaining our golf courses and those things, they said that would qualify as an essential component. Um, so the number that Jeff talked about, and you'll see it all over our press releases, it is a call center that they are creating to do this. And the call center is not up yet? Pardon? Does that mean the call center is not up yet? You said they're. Um, it was supposed to be up this afternoon. Okay, and then did also I wasn't quite clear on what you said. Mowing golf courses is the same as or different than mowing lawns. Correct, and that's where we have to look at it because of the logic based on. So this ties into other issues that we have in terms of code enforcement, and you can't let that go, and some people aren't able to do it. And, and so you have those issues, and, and that'll be something I will put into the county myself and get okay. that answer. Okay. All right. Just, just so you know, we're, we're asking very similar questions because we're struggling trying to find the nuances and, and really get what applies to us. So we okay, so question. don't know yet, but it's a high priority question. Correct. And then I just got uh, some information from Kathy. Uh, it says the Fed relief bill is supposed to allow contract workers. Is that yep, right? people with uh, the, not the W-2s, but the 1099. Um, contract workers, it looks like potentially 1099s to get unemployment. And so, again, those are things we just have to digest to answer some of these questions. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions from council? Council member Ferry? Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, I was wondering, and maybe Joni can speak to this about um, efforts being made to reach out to banks to modify loans. Um, something that I've been hearing from small business folks and even homeowners, people who, um, landlords, is, you know, we are in an, and I'm tired of saying this word in my lifetime, we are experiencing something unprecedented. And we need to change and be creative in how we are approaching this. And maybe it's something where banks are shifting, like putting a freeze on what they're um, on the principal and stop interest payment and bump it to the end of their loan. I mean, I'm just throwing ideas, things that I've heard, things that we've discussed um, in different um, organizations that I've been working with in um, reaching out to um, our federal and state governments. I just wanted to I'm gonna ask Kathy. I'm gonna ask Kathy to come up and this may be as a part of your briefing. So Kathy's gonna answer some of those questions when she when she gets into her briefing um, uh, regarding I think Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and what what they're doing. So if we can hold that question into Kathy's briefing and just stay on the business side, that would help us a lot. Uh, are there any more questions for Joni on the business side? Liz, I'm Harold, you wave your hand. Yeah, I want to correct what I said. I just went through the order more thoroughly. On page seven, landscapers are included, and that but that is in the Boulder County order. We just don't know yet what's coming okay. from the governor. Right. Thank you. And again, you're seeing we're still digesting all of this information. Any other questions on the business side? Kathy, are you ready for your update? You're going to speak up to get into Kenny. Hello, Council. Uh, Kathy Fedler, um, Housing and Community Investment Coordinator. And I was Karen for a time, but Karen's back. Yay. So, um, high level look at housing and individual assistance on the federal level um, there is a moratorium on foreclosures and evictions for single family homeowners with fha insured mortgages for the next 60 days that was part of the um, president's order uh, forbearance can be offered which pauses your mortgage payments um, hud is looking at ways to increase budget authority for housing authorities that are starting to experience um, their HAP payments, the portion that the housing authority pays to landlords, rising due to uh, tenant paid portion, um, loss of income on the tenant side so they can pay less. So we're um, starting to hit some budget uh, capacity. So they are looking at how to impact that. <clears throat> on the state level, um, the governor uh, said that landlords should wait late fees through April, avoid rent increases and delay evictions. And of course, we're under an eviction stay here in Boulder County. Um, they also provided, the state is providing $3 million for rent assistance that we think is gonna be rolled out through the housing authorities. Um, we have a group of the three um, housing um, programs of City of Boulder, City of Longmont, and Boulder County, as well as the three housing authorities working on uh, trying to get information on that and how that will roll out. Um, there's also have the Colorado Works and TANF that's available through the state and unemployment benefits. Um, then <clears throat> I guess I would caution our advice uh, for folks that um, are struggling to pay their rent or their mortgage the advice is always to um, call and talk to the mortgage or lien holder or um, landlord, ask for help and consideration around uh, their issues that they're having. And again, for mortgages, they can ask for forbearance. Um, they can also contact the uh, Boulder County um, Financial Counseling Program, uh, who we pay to work on foreclosure prevention. Uh, they will serve as a mediator or a facilitator with the mortgage companies, um, as well as asking and um, outlining forbearance and workout situations. So, <clears throat> excuse me, 
um, that is something that uh, is available for everybody. Um, and then this, before I get into further county um, things, I want to say that city staff has been participating in all calls um, and all the different uh, groups that have formed around um, dealing with the various things that are popping up um, <clears throat> to make sure that Longmont needs are considered. Um, we have a great partnership with all of those uh, different agencies um, and groups and um, want to point out that the county has the bulk of resources. Um, so we are working with them to prioritize all of the funding um, that is available in collaboration, um, as well as um, funding that we might have available as, as well to make sure that we're addressing gaps and needs that aren't already being met. Um, we did hold a call with uh, individual senior independent developments. Um, there was about six different um, developments that hopped on that call just to touch base and make sure that um, those are operating on the same um, page, their visitor um, um, policies are comparable, that people are letting in home service workers, home health workers, um, and people for groceries and that kind of thing that they're not shutting down totally. So that's another way that we've reached out to the community to help um, the seniors um, in our community make sure that their needs are being met. <laughs> So the county also operates the housing stabilization program with the human services safety net for individuals and families experiencing housing instability. There's a rapid rehousing program and the home study program that the R Center operates within um, Longmont. Um, both the Boulder County and Longmont Community Foundations are raising funds, um, primarily right now funding for nonprofits that are providing direct services, um, but the community foundation was a good source of um, extra funding for us during the flood um, so that we could continue to serve people who are undocumented and aren't eligible for federal um, or state funding that might have restrictions um, with it. So in the city services, um, community and neighborhood resources has been in contact with over 950 rental property owners um, to uh, talk to them about the eviction stay order, um, not raising rents, uh, where they can turn if people aren't able to pay their rent, um, what we can do to try and help that. Um, they're still doing mediations between landlords and tenants if that's needed, and they provide resource um, information and referral and support to renters, um, particularly through a couple different um, organizations that they can refer to. Um, CNR does have the ability to take on more cases. Um, they triage and then refer out what they can um, and continue to mediate and facilitate with landlords. So um, as we get you information on who to call when you get issues around um, that you're hearing about people maybe trying to get evicted or not, unable to pay their rent, it may be CNR that um, they get sent to, but we'll give you that information. Um, my division is continuing to provide emergency grants uh, for water heaters or furnaces, other kinds of emergency health and safety issues. We have that set up so we can do that remotely um, so that work can continue. And then senior services, um, the counseling staff is still providing services and information, referral and assistance. Um, uh, we've been working closely with Cultivate, which is a nonprofit organization uh, to ensure grocery delivery um, for seniors in particular. Um, and then the Friends Organization of the Seniors um, has got um, a funding source for that can be used for undocumented senior um, older adults as well. So that's a source that we're looking at. Um, on the food situation, the Meals on Wheels is in full operation with backup plans in place and partnerships with restaurants set up so that if something happens in Meals on Wheels, somebody gets sick or they can't continue, um, we've got um, uh, plan B and I think a plan C as well. Um, the R Center is providing lunches through drive through and all three groceries through drive through. Um, they're operating right now while spring break is going on for the school districts, um, and the school districts will take that back over um, when spring break is over. Um, St. John's Food Bank is still operating in the round pantry as well, so people can still get uh, resources through there. Um, we are keeping in contact with our human service um, agencies 
um, to determine what ongoing needs that they have um, and help helping to address them. Um, we also, I wanted to share in one of the meetings that I was on, we talked about um, providing Zoom meetings or podcasts to get information out to the community about some of these resources and services. So the website's great, but there's also other ways of getting that out. Um, and we, uh, apparently one of the agencies tried a Zoom meeting and it was very successful and, and um, helpful. So that's something that we'll be also looking at to get word out on stuff. <clears throat> Around individuals experiencing homelessness, um, as you know, the evening shelters are open um, at the two churches. They are screening for symptoms outside of the shelters. Um, we are transporting to the COVID Recovery Center in um, East Boulder. Seven folks are at that center so far since last Friday night when it opened. Um, one of those is from Longmont, so only one has been transported from Longmont. Uh, volunteering has been good so far, um, and we are looking, the county is actually hiring some people to staff and oversee the CRC so that we aren't dependent on volunteers all the time. On the showering, um, that is operating in conjunction with the shelters. Uh, the showering happens right before each shelter opens and it gets, um, it goes back and forth. Um, those are also screened, folks are screened before um, services are provided. Um, they can shower up to three times per week. Uh, first time is they just show up and um, get in and after that then it is on a uh, reservation basis. Um, so they'll have access to that and they sign up for specific days and times. Um, two people used it on Monday, a couple more last night. Um, so we will continue to report out on how, how that's working. Um, and then the restrooms are open at most of the parks. I think eight different parks have restrooms that are open. Another 12 is supposed to open by the end of this week. Um, and they are being cleaned twice a day is my understanding. Um, and I'm just looking at some of my, so one of the ongoing needs that we do have is to um, ensure we have resources for folks that are undocumented. So we will continue to work on, on that. Um, the other need that um, has popped up is, and that we're still trying to understand, is around um, providing medications for folks that are, as especially as they shelter in place, uh, delivery of medications. That was a real issue during the flood, getting people their medications. Um, so uh, working on a system to, to um, help provide that. So I think that's pretty much everything that I had. So if there's any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Hi, Kathy, this is Joan. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you very much for all the work you've done. I know this is really detailed. Um, my question is about Airbnbs. Those uh, rentals are usually, uh, they're made months in advance. Uh, does an Airbnb fall under a business? Are they allowed to still keep working, people coming from other states? And if they are, are the renters being told about our uh, status here as far as uh, the rules and the closure? So that's probably a legal question. Again, I think um, Airbnbs or short-term rentals are included to be shut down, uh, not to operate, um, non-essential. I don't know. I think there's an exception for- okay. I, I will shut up and I'm not the person to answer yeah. that. <laughs> So there's a residence exemption and then there's something related to hotels for essential travel. We'll need to probably dig into that one because it doesn't fit squarely into a category. So we can ask that question as well. Okay. Hey, Harold, uh, Harold, I'm oh, sorry. Just, just Harold, Eugene, go ahead. I'm sorry. Hi, Council, Eugene May here. So uh, there is a definition of residences in the Boulder County order. I think it's premature without seeing the governor's order that we know is now pending to really speculate. Okay. I think that uh, the residences, I think the purpose there is more of a long term. If people are coming in for short term, you know, is that business? Um, that that seems to be the question. And uh, I think we wait until the governor's order is out. Okay. Thank you, Eugene. 
Harold, it's Brian. Uh, hey, just uh, just one thing as an aside. I don't know when it's appropriate to point it out, but driving over here, our, our golf courses are closed, right? Correct. They are full. Sunset Correct. Golf Course had had uh, foursomes on. On I mean, anyway, I'm, I'm just seeing lots of people playing golf. That's on the list. Um. No, the golf course is already closed. That that's not related to the order. They're closed. Are there any questions on what Kathy presented? No questions? All right. So um, now I'm gonna, what does all this mean for us? Um, Jim, you still on the line? Yeah, I'm here. So I'm gonna ask Jim to jump in and go over what this means with us. I know Jim sent some information to Mariah and Rigo to get to the media about what he's going up. He sent it to you all. So Jim, do you want to go over that information? You bet. So council, I did send that just at the beginning of this meeting to y'all in an email. I'm just gonna run through that. My comments are in there and I'll add some more to it at the end. So, you know, I, this is uh, all about some rough estimates for us to be able to try to start to begin to do some budget, here, particularly for 2020, and what we need to do in the face of budgetary shortfalls we will, uh, will be surely facing, but how much and how big is the question? The approach that I took was that I wanted to estimate that for 2020, I was gonna get two full months of sales tax for January, February, and then followed by at some point, two full months of severe impacts on sales and use tax because of this uh, 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 coronavirus uh, you know, impacts. Then I got built into there that I would probably end the rest of the year, the following eight months, some sort of a recession. How big? Is a, is a question though. Um, beyond 2020, I'm sure there would continue to be a recession. We would that as well for our planning for 2021, but we would uh, not be doing 2021 estimates for a couple more months, so we'll have a better handle on where we're at. So using that type of approach, and I hope conservative estimating, I'm projecting a $14 billion revenue impact in 20 for the five funds that receive sales and use tax. One million of that is from reduced revenue uh, from recreation, as well as investment revenue. And we're gonna have investment revenue impacts in all of our funds. Um, remaining $13 million is my sales and use tax uh, revenue shortfall estimate. Uh, so the breakout set $14 million of shortfall 2020, 7.8 million in the fund, 550,000 in the public improvement fund, 0.75 million in the streets fund, three quarters of a million in the open space fund, 2.2 million dollars in the public safety fund. So one thing I'll point out right away is uh, we're not concerned that it's gonna impact our ability to make any debt service payments in 2000. We're, we're fine in that re regard. And we've begun to talk to staff about the shortfall and have them begin to do some planning about budget adjustments. You no, know, last week we asked you to uh, set, uh, tell us to set aside $1.6 million that was headed towards the emergency reserve station instead that's in the uh, fund fund balance can be used to and to offset some of this revenue shortfall on that fund uh, we're identifying one-time dollars uh budgeted throughout each of these five funds that we can either put on hold or else make those somehow available to offset the shortfall Public safety fund, I'm concerned about that. It's gonna be a challenge. Most of the expenses in that fund are salary and benefits. So there's not a lot of opportunity for savings there. We are gonna to have to have, uh, 
some thought into how we're going to deal with that. But there will definitely be, be some adjustments to operating budgets in most of these funds. Uh, we will get back with you to, to let you know what our plans are as soon as we can, as soon as we identify them. Uh, we have ideas identified, but Harold has uh, not had time to deal with that. At this point, we're going to get with him, see what he's good with, and go forward with that and bring them to you for uh, your review as well. Again, the estimates are only based on two months of extreme shortfalls. If conditions persist longer than that, the impacts would grow by at least four and a half million dollars per month. What I did with my estimates is I really took a look at everything that made up our estimates in March and April of last year and determined which of these are good candidates to continue. The grocery stores, the discount stores, uh, sales tax, just the sure things. So that's why I hope that this is a uh, uh, a, uh, a conservative estimate. Um, what we're doing for sure right away, we're going to be, we're not, we haven't stopped hiring positions. We're doing a selective hiring freeze. Um, most positions probably frozen, but there are some that will be crucial to this effort. Uh, new cap capital projects, we're not starting any, they're going to be on hold until we can make decisions on uh, what we need to withstand these shortfalls and also to see how long this might be going on. The bond projects that we, we funded last year, I'm happy to say those are not impacted because it's bond money and those monies are, are set aside. It's not impacted by sales tax. We're going to take a little bit of hit on the earnings that we were projected on that, but I think we're still in, in a position to fund the budget for those bond projects. Uh, we are reviewing most of our expenditures before they're made to make sure that they're for high priority expenses or high necessity expenses at this point in time. Uh, enterprise funds, even though they're not listed here, I said that each fund will be impacted from their investment revenues. We also need to be concerned about uh, our, our uh, bill payers and their ability to pay their monthly bills. So we're trying to watch that closely to see what the impacts will be there. So they're, they're uh, ready to proceed with caution as well. I'm monitoring the city's revenue daily, particularly, like I said, the utility bill payments and the, and the sales tax that we're receiving to see if there's any trends developing. It's early. Uh, the sales tax that we're reviewing now is really set as sales tax for February operations. So, and, Theoretically, those operations were not impacted. So that's all I'm seeing now with the reflection of the ability to pay right now versus uh, whether or not we're seeing the reductions in, in, so, or how much. So I will not know the impact on sales tax for um, at least a month as far as the, the business activity going down. So that that's all not due to us until April 20th. So it will be hard to see whether these projections I've made are too low or too high anytime before that point in time. That's all I had. If you had any questions, I could try to answer them. Any questions, Mayor and Council? Uh, it's 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 Brian. Hey Jim, just a question. How much how how much were in our, our uh, reserves? And is this the time we use those reserves or do the reserves stay there and we just kind of figure out how to, so far, the anticipated shortfall? Uh, Mayor Bagley, I wish I could do that off the top of my head. I can give you a second, I can pull it up. But my, the answer to the second part of the question is we certainly should be looking at that. 1.67 million is the amount that was, was there for a stabilization, so basically for a time like this. So uh, short of that, I think we had another uh, $300,000 that was in that uh, reserve before uh, 2019. So that would be uh, certainly a, a source to look at as well. Um, but we have another center of reserves as well that is an emergency reserve. I think we'll, we'll be talking about that 
I'm bringing that back to you for consideration when we bring other other recommendations. All right, and I guess the follow-up follow question is, so if we have, so let's, I mean, if this is all over in two months and it's not a big deal, that's not me, by the way. Maybe it is feedback. Yeah. Is it so? But I guess my question is: if the follow-up question is, if we continue to see, so let's if if some of these restaurants and small businesses go under, right, um, or when, whatever. But if that were to happen and this were to persist, and we have not a fourteen million dollar, but maybe a fifty million dollar shortfall, at what point? Um, do the wheels come off the wagon? E meaning, um, how, I, I want to know how severe is a $14 million shortfall in layman's terms? And should it get worse? Um, at what point do you really, really, really get worried? Well, I, I'm worried already. <laughs> so I, I would say, though, no, at this point, uh, I, well, we're, we, we, and this two months, we believe. I think we will, as we start to go uh, further out at four and a half million dollars more per month, I think it's going to begin to, to affect our operating budget for 2020 pretty significantly. And as I mentioned, that public safety fund has uh, um, mostly salary and benefits. Well, uh, the general fund has a lot of salary and benefits in it as well. Uh, so, what we're saying now is we can withstand two months and we're going to come back to you and let you know how we're going to do that but as it if it moves farther on i wish i could tell you exactly when but it's going to begin to impact services if we, if the, if the revenues don't come back now there's a certain portion of them will be there one way or the other but they won't all come back that fast all right and i guess and last final question is um so well, we know it's going to go for at least another three and a half weeks, right? And then whatever the repercussions are after that will be the repercussions. Um, what I, I hate. What are the what what services do we have as a city? I mean, just anticipating. So we're not caught flat footed. Should that happen? Um, what are the services that the city would look to? Uh, what services do we have in a situation like this that we consider fat? or even lean muscle or, or non-lean muscle that, that we turn to for it first. Obviously police and fire, no. Um, but what where do we where do we start? So so let me jump in and answer that question. So I want to answer the first question and say, are we concerned? Yes. I mean and, and what have we done because we're concerned? So there's a few things. Um, Essentially, the hiring freeze where I'm going to make the decision on what positions we fill and what positions we don't fill. Second piece is saying don't spend the one time funding that we have that we put in the budget because we may need it. The third piece is stock capital projects. You know, if we're already in it, we're in it and we've got to finish it. But anything that we haven't started, we need to stop that so that we can understand what that looks like and then take the broader. You know, then understand here's what we have and this is what it looks like. The piece on the next piece is, is a harder conversation. And what I will tell you is that's what we're getting into right now to then understand is, is what does that look like and what are the triggers? And so the way I want to structure it is we, we have a menu of things. And as we're understanding, we're, we're ticking through that menu. The challenge that we have, and this is a question when I say we're hearing the same thing that the community's hearing. So we have the same questions coming from the people that, that serve our residents on a daily basis. Am I going to have a job? Am I going to do this? And what we've said is based on what we know today, uh, we feel like we can manage through this situation. If it continues, the last thing I want to touch is the people that serve this organization on a daily basis. Because at the end of the day, when it flips, we're still going to need to be there to, to do certain things. And what I will tell council is we will have that answer for you. We're just having to work through it right now. Thanks, Harold. And also, Jim, thank you. Are there any other questions? Harold, this is Tim. Uh, 
Uh, questions for Jim, or just are we at the end of this? Uh, questions for Jim or me on the financial piece? No, I, I'll mute. I do have some questions, but not for Jim. Okay. Okay. I do have a question, and I don't know if you've yes, had a chance to read the HR uh, 6379 about the um, taking responsibility, take responsibility for workers and family act. What are some of the things as I'm reading um, some of the safeguards, monies um, given to um, businesses and, um, and I want to see local governments in there. Um, I'm kind of browsing through right now. What would be some of the impacts or some relief that we could receive from that? And what are some other things we can be as a council or um, even pushing forward to our state and federal level, just like using utilizing the bully pulpit, so to speak, um, to push to get relief um, for our local government? So, so the simple answer to that is really it's going to be embedded in the legislation that really tax uh, that addresses how FEMA is going to approach and how they're going to work with cities. Uh, the, 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 the dollars that are created, if they have a, a DR type component on this, it's a little bit different because every city in the United States is going through this. Um, I know there is a lot of chatter today about, at least in the Senate bill, um, in, in contacting our, our federal representative about um, making sure that cities and cities like Longmont and counties like Boulder County fall into the category that can receive certain funds. I think at one point, and again, this is churning really fast. I think at one point early today, I heard it was like a half a million as a population, which would exclude us. So I think if council can do one thing is, is to call our, our federal representatives and say, we need to ensure that cities in Colorado are included in this. Um, it may have changed. Um, I know it's churning. And um, CML is engaged in this, and I think they're also sending information out to council members. But right now, that's the biggest piece. I did receive an email from Joe Nagusa's office, and I'll read through that, and I could set forward you that information. But I, I want to think as I browse through it, it might address some of those things, and I think we are included. Maybe, yeah. I haven't had a chance to get that briefing yet. Any other financial questions? So, I want to kind of, there's no more questions. Um, Couple of things I want to cover, um, and, it, and it ties into some of these questions. Um, the one thing I hope that council saw and the community saw is that there is a lot of work being done right now. And to, to give you a sense of what our days look like, um, I'm looking at a schedule here. And so OEM comes in for a briefing at eight. Um, they then have a nine o'clock call with the county in terms of the coordination. Today we have Every day at 10, we have what we call uh, a CAN WebEx call from the organization where I'm meeting with everyone, figuring out what are we hearing, what's going on. Then today at 1030, there was an economic impact WebEx. Um, at 12, we have the leadership WebEx where I meet with the leadership team. At one every day, there's a group where all the local administrators are sitting down and talking to each other, making sure we're in alignment or we know what's coming at us. Um, at three o'clock, right? Three o'clock, there's a state coordination call. Um, and then at 4.30, we have another call in terms of figuring out what everyone's working on. And so the volume right now is, is tremendous. And, and so we're doing this, dealing with the issue today and then doing the work of looking at the issue tomorrow that you're seeing on the business side and the individual housing side. And working with Jim on the financial side and directors doing this. 
and, and so I want, I hope today we communicated everything that's going on. The, uh, the big thing that we need, um, and you've heard this before, is PPE, which is personal protective equipment. Um, we have a lot of community members coming to us and contacting to us, and so if, if you all know of anybody or can help with that, that, that is a big need for us. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, we hear about healthcare workers and we hear about first responders, but we also need it in terms of the folks that are working at Bills on Wheels, our senior folks, that may have to <clears throat> work with clients or what we've had to do with the housing authority. I know you all know that we're having conversations about the housing authority and their situation and how we come together. I will tell you now, we've really folded them in in our response so that they can be integrated and have the support they need. But literally last week, we got a call, they need gloves and masks because we're going into people's homes. And so PPE is an important issue for us. Um, we are in the process of trying to secure volunteers. I know we sent an email out to council regarding uh, getting volunteers for the CRC facility in Boulder. Um, we have been uh, fighting through some transportation issues, we think we have that solved. We may need volunteers for transportation, so that may be coming out. So I think the second thing that council can really help us on is when we can clarify what we need and where, and getting volunteers for that, that is a big um, help to us. We're being very careful, because I will tell you, one of the tenets of how we are all trained um, is that donation and volunteer management can also be a simultaneous disaster if it's not done well. And so that's what we're trying to do to make sure we don't get over overwhelmed in that area. Probably the biggest thing that council can help us with and the community can help us with um, is really getting the community to comply with the order um, and still support local businesses in the way that the order allows for that to occur. Um, the reality is, and people go, why are they taking these steps? I will tell you, I've had staff take pictures of different locations in terms of what people are doing and how we respond. I mean, there is individual responsibility, there's organizational responsibility, and there's community responsibility. Um, and, and what a lot of people are reacting to, and, and we're better than most. So let me just say that. But when they go to a park and they see 50 kids on the playground equipment and 10 10 to 20 parents sitting in a shelter, people are reacting to that saying they're not, people aren't listening to the advice we're giving. And so that is also creating escalation in, in, in decision making. And so one of the most important things that council can do is to help us communicate, conduct the orders, do this, because at the end of the day, we're not going to get through this based on the federal government's actions, the state's government's actions. We're going to get through this based on the actions of all of us as individuals and as a community. And as a community, we can get through this. Um, we, this community has faced any number of challenges. We can do it as a community. We just have to do it together and we all have to be in. Because to Jeff's point, and what I want to reiterate, if they can get through this, and if you want to put pressure, put pressure on elected officials to test it and making sure that Colorado gets the same amount of testing as other places. Because we know that if we can get that and this, what we're hearing is that may shorten time frames. We could, but they need both of these components to work together. Um, so if you go, what do we need? I think that's what we need right now. Um, and the other thing we need is, um, and I know it's hard in these cases, is time and patience. Um, because we are churning on about 200 different things during the day. And I, I think that's a pretty accurate number. And that's the big thing. Do you have any questions for me? Well, I have several. Okay. It's Tim. Tim? So one is, it's not, it's not a question in the weeds, it's a real issue, but it, it does apply to a specific facility. Um, I know childcare has been a, is an ongoing kind of a rolling issue for uh, first responders, 
healthcare, uh, medical personnel, folks who, who are basically mission critical and have children largely, in this case, of school age who are otherwise supervised and would have been. In some cases, in, and I'm thinking specifically now um, about folks who are, are, are critical, I don't think they're, they're not identified as first responders. I'm thinking about air traffic controllers. My understanding right. that Jets uh, is now shut down uh, because they had somebody who was identified or who was diagnosed and they're shut down for 72 hours. Uh, it is the Y or other facilities, are those options for the parents of kids who would have been who are, who are uh, air traffic controllers who would have been at junior jets? I know that's in the weeds, but but that's going to be one of the an example of a rolling issue. They're as critical, in, at least in some of those folks, are as critical as our first responders. What do we say to them uh, in terms of what their options are in the next few days, the next five or five days, or what? They're they're closed through Monday. So let me, let me ask. You what the why is a, is that all you have on child care? That's all I have on child care. I have I have a couple of other questions and a comment. Let me get, if I can get through child care, the why sure. is open. What a lot has changed. The why also had to close. Hi. Hi. So the why, um, the Lama Y also had to close down because of the sickness. So it's a mandatory 72 hours. So um, so they're closed, but they are open again on Friday. But it's a, it's a state regulation, so if someone gets sick, then they, they do have to close down for a 72 hour period. So the Lama Y is in that same boat, but will be open on Friday. So to that question, so earlier today, I mean, and again, how does this change? You're getting real time change. So what we're trying to do is we knew we had some spots available at the Y. We have the same issues for critical personnel within our organization. Um, and we were going to, to talk about repurposing some of the contracts for our folks. We also are working through what we need to do to move our licensing so we can handle certain components of child care within our structure and what we have done. So you normally see us do this in the summer. And so a couple hours ago, the direction I said I gave is to say, let's look at utilizing the Y. Let's get ourselves ready to fill this void so that if there's overflow at the Y for the critical personnel, we have the ability to where we can pull some of ours off and others and put it into other facilities in order to create capacity there and how do we partner in those things. Obviously, that's changed, and I think we need to probably get those options, that'll be on my list for when we finish this. And so things like this, as soon as you all hear this, if you can get, what I will say is, you, you know now that Karen's here and Kathy's here. So if anything community service related, get it in, if you can get it into them as quickly as possible um, so that we can start churning. But my work item from here is to get these other components um, ready so we can absorb the need. All right, welcome back, Karen, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there, so you'll will there be some capacity to post real time on our website or the community connections uh, uh, site that man, uh, Marsh is managing uh, when these things come up that they get posted and if you're if you're now um, in need of, of assistance or child care, where do you click or who do you call? Where do you go next? Right, because people are gonna have to solve those problems like in real time, right? If they're mission critical, whether they're city personnel, medical care or uh, medical staff or, or air traffic controllers. Um, so let me go, I wanna, I had a question on here before uh, the mayor made a comment about golf courses. I, on a bike ride out yesterday, I saw folks out on the U Creek golf course. Um, and, uh, that's not surprising to me. The golf courses are closed, but people live close by, right? The residents are gonna take advantage of being out but I did get then a call or a, a, a text from a constituent saying, what do we do? They saw people on the golf course. What should we do? My response was, if you wanna, if you wanna call, that a public safety would be the only response. That's how that's gonna get enforced. It won't be code enforcement or somebody else, not golf course personnel, there are no volunteers out there. I also said, however, our law enforcement folks are 
paying attention to a whole bunch of other things right now and um, probably not going to be responsive to somebody on a golf course. Uh, I know they're, they're closed. There were people, but not many. Um, what, what, how, how can we help when we get those kinds of questions? What's the response for that kind of behavior that our public safety folks or you would like us to be offering to constituents? Not like look the other way, but at this point in time, we've got to set some priorities and not, that's probably not a high priority for public safety. What's your advice? So, so what we're doing, so let, I will frame that conversation in terms of parks and how we're going to deal with it. Um, and so there is a process through Boulder County that they're working on where it comes in, and this is really businesses, because we've received a lot of calls about, well, why is this business open? Well, when you turn through it, it was okay for it to be open. Um, and so there's a process there. On, in terms of how we're going to deal with parks, and we'll fine tune this tomorrow based on your question, is we were really looking at our parks employees and our code enforcement officers to, to have that interaction. And again, our, our philosophy is going to be to educate. Educate and inform as we have the interaction. We will spread that to the golf group too. Um, and so that's going to be the, the primary component. And then only if that doesn't work, will we then consider the next phase. But it's really, we're trying to use non-law enforcement people for the first engagement in this as we have that conversation. All right. Karen, do you have anything on it? And we're also doing maintenance on the golf courses. So like um, we will be this week aerating uh, sunset yeah. is aeration and yeah. so we're trying to do that kind of uh, work that makes it not um, very good yeah. playing uh, but we are we are talking about that Tim in, in terms of our because we have our, our, our maintenance staff that's out there so we really want to help people comply and and figure out how to do that and that without that being a call to public safety yeah, yeah. I, you know, the, it was posted. The, it was posted. The golf course was posted. The people shouldn't be out there. But, but that's yeah. not, not going to persuade some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My one of my concerns is I people out there with their dogs and, and frisbees and people walking the golf course and golfers. You know that doesn't mix well. Right? When right. Golf balls flying around with civilians. That's not a good idea. But it is what happens. No, we're, yeah, uh, another colleague of mine in another city, um, they closed their dog parks and now they're walking their dogs on the golf course. And yeah, there you go. We all know what that can do yeah. to the grass. Yep. And so yep. Yep. any number of issues. Unrelated, I have uh, one more question and then one observation. The question is this, unrelated to the, this agenda, but related to the use of WebEx, uh, we're, we're, I assume this is how we're going to meet on Tuesday evenings on forward. Um, and as I'm sitting here thinking, and I've mentioned this to you before, how am I going to get to my my council materials in a WebEx format? I, I can minimize my screen and have my Dropbox open, and I can flip back and forth. Is that is that how we're going to have to do this? Let me get with Sandy. This was today was uh, obviously a rush because we knew some things were coming. Yeah. Um, but let me get with them and figure that out. I think all of you are going to have individual needs, so we may to have that conversation individually. Well, as, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, yeah, I can do that. I can flip back and forth. I just didn't know if there was a better solution. Uh, the, last, for me, the last observation, and this is going to sound Pollyannish and like a broken record, but, um, you know, it's every time we meet, we, we hear a lot of worse fears, and I, you know, this is the broken record part of this, and there are a ton of, of worse fears everybody brings to this right now. And, that, and I think they have to be acknowledged. But personally, I think if, if we're going to do public service announcements and those kinds of things, in addition to sharing information, I, I'd like for us to be sharing what our best hopes are on the far side of this. Because there's going to be a far side of this, and we need to be as clear on what we'd like to see and how we strategize towards that. What's the preferred future? It won't be like it was in the past. We just have to acknowledge that. And there's going to be a lot of, of heartache that we're going to have to be on. But it, it's in our interest as a council. It's in our interest as a leadership group in the city and others in the city who are leaders to be as, as clear and as coherent and as articulate 
and as aspirational about a future as we were before this. It'll just be different, and we're going to have a lot of support we're going to have to provide to a lot of people. And again, it's, I don't want to be naive. I, I, I recognize what those worst fears are. But if I dwell on, if, if we strategize to avoid them, we will create them. We need to, we need to think differently about the future and, and what it's going to take to get what we hope for on the other side of this. Waters is out. <laughs> so I, yeah, I have a statement along those lines. I'd like to observe as, as I've, I have been contacting the public in as many ways as I can think of to make sure everybody's all right, to hear what people's concerns are, to learn what their observations are. And it's been wonderful and inspired. People are finding cracks in the safety net that I didn't know existed and coming up with suggestions about how to fill them up. People have been looking after each other. Um, people have been um, just doing amazing things to, um, to get us all through this uh, from, from the, you know, the, the tiny little things like finding each other's lost pets to um, huge things like a project to move ventilators around the country and get them where they are going to be. Um, if you look at the helpers in our community, they're finding new ways to connect with one another. Um, so for example, uh, restaurants banding together to uh, uh, prepare food for Meals on Wheels so that they can deliver meals less frequently and in more bulk. You know, that's a brilliant idea. And guess what? Those, those um, restaurants are getting paid to do that, not as much as they would, you know, selling retail. But on the other hand, uh, Meals on Wheels rejected a couple of the offers because they were too low and they wanted to make sure that, uh, that uh, the contributors were compensated fairly and not losing money on this. And that's a great way to keep our businesses in business. So uh, I am just want to thank the public of Longmont um, for their creativity and their compassion and um, watch for the helpers because, um, you know, Longmont Public Media is going to be publishing a series of, of videos about the helpers. Um, uh, we're all going to be trying to spread the word about that. and. I know that it will help everyone to think in those terms as, as we do get through this crisis. So thanks everybody. Harold, I guess, I guess my only comment was, uh, uh, my best hope would be that uh, uh, you speak with Jeff. The governor's order is to end on April 11th. That's two and a half weeks rather than three and a half weeks. And as I'm taking away everything, yes, of course, everything, I mean, sooner or later, over the next 10 to 20 years, we will recover. Um, but what I would hope for is that if we do not have access to tests, let us out and let's get on with this. Um, and, and we do anything and everything we can um, to speed up the tests coming as soon as possible because from what I heard, everything I'm hearing, every, or whatever I heard, what, the things I was hearing Jeff say were uh, uh, the sooner that comes and the sooner we get people tested, the sooner we can actually approach this with some type of uh, 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 process that would be effective. But if it's, if it's, if it's not coming, um, we're wasting our time. And uh, so I'm, I'm certainly, I'm not preaching doom and gloom. I'm pointing out that we are, we are currently doing the things that we are doing that will lead to disaster. And my hope would be that we either stop or, or put a hard press on state and federal folks to get testing be beginning. And I think to that comment, Mayor Council, if you can start that hard press with your contacts in the federal level and delegation in the, in the state level, start it now. Um, I have a comment I wanna bring up. Um, I want to emphasize the importance of not just the council, but community out there to the community as well. It does make an impact when we are contacting and flooding our 
um, federal our congressmen, our uh, state legislators, all the powers that be, when we are flooding their lines with sending the same message of concern for our businesses, for our um, for our um, our homes, our livelihoods, that they need to take action. It does work. I was working with a coalition um, well, through CEA and then push through to get state testing halted. It works. Okay, we, I'm working with the statewide coalition, and we were reaching out with other states as well. New York City. Um, we're working to pass moratoriums on mortgages and um, rent freezes. And we are seeing action being done. They're listening to us. We just need to get out there and we need to start voicing our concerns. Um, I, you know, I propose that we do some kind of unilateral either letter to the, um, the public or some kind of resolution where we are all coming together. With, these are what we advocate for. These are what we, we want from our, for our residents. So if there's an appetite for that, I would like to see something like that move forward as well. Harold, I have a comment. This is Polly. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank, if, if we're closing up, I want to thank all my fellow council members and I hope we all, everybody stays well. Um, I've already been in quarantine today This was for two weeks, and I'm supposed to be out today, but, oh, I guess not. Um, <laughs> I, I would suggest that people who can, everyone who can, donate to the Community Foundation uh, to help us have um, something that the community feels like they are contributing. Uh, I think that... Um, there's certainly plenty of reason for people to have doom and gloom about this, but we will get through this. And I think we need to send out that positive message. Um, I also think that we should th remember to thank all the people who are providing us with services, to literally thank them. I wrote a no note on my mailbox today, thanking my postal lady, and she wrote back and said, thank you, I really appreciate that. Because, you know, they're just slugging along there and they're all alone and they need to know that we do appreciate it. Um, I would also suggest that maybe we consider at our meeting on uh, Tuesday, giving some money from the contingency fund to, uh, to where it's needed to go. Um, we'll need to have uh, Harold suggest to us what is the most needed area that maybe we could give 30,000, which is half of our contingency fund. Um, I would also remind people to please fill out your census. You've got a lot of time in your hands, fill out your census or we will not be getting any money and any representation. So please do it now. You got it in the mail, please do it. And um, Everybody look out for each other and be a little more kind and a little more uh, Pollyanna-ish, as <laughs> Councilman Waters said, it's not being Pollyanna-ish, it's being understanding that we have, we have had very difficult times before, we've gotten through them and we're gonna get through this too. It's not without going to be without damage, but you know, we'll get through it just like we always do. Thank you. Aaron, Joan, do you have any comments? Just uh, thank everybody. This was very informative. Aaron, do you have any comments? Uh, I want to thank council for coming together quickly and allowing us to uh, present a lot of information. Um, you actually got a chance to see the churn that's happening. Um, what I want to tell you in the community is this. Um, our job is to prepare for the worst case situation, hope for the best, and drive to the best. Um, we have a thousand folks that work on a daily basis to support the community in any number of ways. 
actually over a thousand when you include our, our folks that are temporary. So I think we're around fourteen hundred. Um, we have people that have dedicated their lives to this community. Um, what I can tell you and what I can tell the community is that every one of us um, are committed to doing everything we can to understand what the best, what the worst fears are, and to truly move to, toward a different outcome. We did it once in 2013, and I know we were all sort of taken aback by that issue. This is a different situation. If we did it then, we can do it now if we do it together. And that's just what I wanted to say. I appreciate you all. I appreciate your contacts. Um, just thank you. Thanks, everyone. Harold, thank you. You're doing a good job. I know you're stressed. Your family misses you. Don't get sick. And uh, save us all from the virus and uh, the economic uh, uh, calamities that are, that are coming. That's all we ask. All we can do is try. And we'll see your next performance review. We'll discuss a race. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Council. If there's nothing else, I'm going to end the meeting. If I can end the meeting. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.